Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday. Every week I go through the current edition of my Sunday sermon. Now, I know a lot of people feel like we're living in unprecedented times, but that just isn't the truth. The taking down of monuments has a very, very long history. In 410 AD, the Visigoths sacked Rome, and the world was shocked by this. The Visigoths were a Germanic tribe from up in the area that the Romans called Gaul, which today is France, Switzerland, northern Italy, in those regions. And the Visigoths actually had converted to Christianity. And so when they they stormed Rome and sacked Rome, um, the uh, pagans fled to the churches and the Visigoths respected the churches, but the but they plundered the pagan temples and the, the large homes of the pagan Romans. Uh, St. Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, in response to this because it caused quite the conversation in the empire. Um, over 400 years before, however, Julius Caesar had his campaign in Gaul and he famously bragged about it and wrote about it in his Gaelic Wars book, which remains the, the primary piece of historical, um, uh, the primary historical reference for that campaign. Now, most historians today believe that, that Julius Caesar, although he postured it as sort of a preemptive defensive attack, that in fact he had incurred massive debts in his political climb to power and he needed money to pay it. And so the way you pay it is you sack and conquer. And he bragged to the Romans in order to gain status and glory from them that he had killed a million in Gaul and he had enslaved a million more. And obviously enslaving people is one way to gain great riches because if you conquer a city or conquer a land, you can take all of the people in bondage and then sell them as slaves. Slavery, in fact, is one of the most nearly universal institutions in all of human history. I know it doesn't seem that way today, here in 2020, um, even if a, as we'll see a little bit later, even as um, was in CNN recently, as a, as a Samoan chief uh, lured his fellow Samoans to New Zealand where they worked on farms and he collected the money um, slavery has been mostly around for much of human history. Uh, during the Roman Empire, some estimate that up to half of the empire were slaves. The two main ways you fell into slavery, pay attention to the language, you fall into slavery as you fall into a pit and you basically get trapped by it. The two ways of falling into slavery, generally speaking, were debt. You got yourself in over your head in one way or another, or you were part of a city or a nation that lost the war. And basically, the conquering army would come up to your city and offer a, um, make an offer that the civic officials couldn't refuse. And it was often something like, well, open the gates and let us in and we'll let you live, but you'll be considered as dead because that's what slaves were. They were non-people. You'd be considered as dead and you will be our property um, all of your social contacts, contracts will end and you will be non-persons because that's what slaves were. Now, slavery, in fact, stands at the basis of almost all of our assumptions about debt and law and personhood. Now, a lot of people like to blame capitalism for a lot of these things, but these stories go back far, far older. And this out of the book, Debt, um, by David Graeber, which was out a number of years ago. Fascinating book, really. One might, might as well ask if our political and legal ideas really founded on the logic of slavery, then how did, how did we ever eliminate slavery? Of course, a cynic might argue that we haven't. We've just relabeled it. A cynic would have a point. An ancient Greek would certainly have seen the, the distinction between slave and indebted wage laborer as, at best, a legalistic nicety. Still, even the elimination of formal chattel slavery um, has to be considered a remarkable achievement, and it is worthwhile to wonder how it was accomplished, especially since it has not just, been it has not just accomplished once. 
The truly remarkable thing, if one consults the historical record, is that slavery has been eliminated or effectively eliminated many times in human history. For example, after the fall of the Roman period in the so-called Dark Ages, it, slavery wasn't really that big a deal in Europe. Now, they had serfdom and indentured status and many other sort of forms of slavery, but not slavery as such as we recognize it now. You see, the truth about human beings is that we make really bad slaves or really bad beasts of burden. Horses and oxen and, and even goats and large dogs will do our bidding for us in many different respects. But human beings have these really large brains and we have all these desires about what we'd like to do and what we'd like to be and where we'd like to go. And that makes us really bad beasts of burden. I should probably change this slide. Um, if you need labor, would you rather buy or rent? Well, let's say basically in the American, in antebellum American South, a slave would cost something of the equivalent of $40,000, a, a, a moderately priced car. The thing is, after you purchased the slave, what were the other costs involved? Food, shelter, health care, and escape prevention. Because remember, human beings make really bad beasts of burden. So if you're open up, opening up that fast food stand and slavery is an option, would you, write, would you like to buy or rent your labor? Actually, renting people is a lot cheaper. And if you were to open a stand today, and if, le if slavery were legal, you would probably rather just pay somebody by the hour to work there. We call this renting a human being. We call giving a job. Um, there's less financial responsibility. If your worker becomes disabled, well, you know, maybe there's government disability or something like that, but you don't bear the cost for that person their whole life. The truth about owning a human being is that it requires an incredibly brutal system to maintain it. And in many respects, that brutal system has to be nationwide. Um, the United States revisited this back during the slave period with the fugitive slave law that basically helped spark the Civil War because the Northerners felt good about themselves and much of the abolition of slavery that had happened in the northern states. But suddenly when they were required to treat um, escaping slaves as property, well, they didn't like that so much. And there's a picture of the Samoan uh, chief who basically lured Samoans over into New Zealand and they worked on New Zealand farms and he got the cash and basically he kept them in squalid conditions because that's really the only way to make slavery viable economically. He was sentenced to 11 years in prison in New Zealand. Really the only way to keep a human being in this state is to intimidate them, threaten them, beat them, but don't kill them because of course if you kill them you lose your investment. Now when the Visigoths sacked Rome and took down and spoiled many of the statues of, of what the pagan Romans imagined was their, their great history, Augustine began one of the greatest works in antiquity. It's in fact one of the longest single authored works in, antiqu in antiquity called The City of God. And what he did in this book was he contrasted the city of God with the city of man or the city of humanity and said basically you can understand history by tracing the history of these two cities through time. Now why did he say city? Well actually it's a little bit deceptive because um, civitas or kiwitas in Latin means not only city but pretty much civilization because in the ancient world cities were the way to be somebody. Cities were the way to amass power. Cities were the way to rule the world. In the beginning of Genesis, we have the story of Adam and Eve and their fall from the garden and their first two sons, Cain and Abel. And quite famously, they both offered sacrifices. Abel's was well received and Cain's was not. So Cain killed his brother Abel and then went into a fit of panic because he thought the world would hunt him down. The Lord put a mark on him so the world wouldn't hunt him down. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Now, again, if you were reading the King James Version, it would be Cain, Cain knew his wife. Keep that in mind for a little bit later in the sermon when someone else will know something else. <laughs> 
So Cain knew his wife, made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. So what we find in the Bible is Cain, the first city builder. Now Cain was followed up by more sons, and one of his more famous ones was Lamech. And Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. And you can see here the development of civilization here in the book of Genesis. Zillah also had a son, Tubal-Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal-Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. He likes to speak of himself in poetry in the third person. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged, is avenged seven times, by God coincidentally, Lamech will avenge himself 77 times. The city of man is well underway. Now, history tells us of a man named Sargon of Akkad. And Sargon of Akkad is also known as Sargon the Great, and he was the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire. This is in Mesopotamia, where Abraham had come from. Known for his conquests of the Sumerian city-states in the 24th and 23rd centuries BC, he is sometimes identified as the first person in recorded history to rule over an empire. He should not be con confused with a YouTuber named, who was named himself Sargon of Akkad. Now, primary sources basically list him as having been raised by a gardener. Um, there's not a lot of primary sources on him, but raised by a gardener. And he usurped the ruler of his city and became the ruler of her city and conquered more cities. And this, in fact, in the ancient world is the way that you win over the world. You conquer your neighbor. Now, there's a very interesting legend of Sargon of Akkad that will be very interesting to us as our story unfolds. The legend of Sargon tells of the power of a Mesopotamian king around 2300. The story may have been written well after Sargon's lifetime. It is nearly impossible to arrive at a precise for the composition of the text. But listen to it, and those of you who know your Bible will begin to understand why we are talking about this man. Sargon, strong king, king of, king of Akkad I am. My mother was a high priestess, my father I did not know. My paternal kin inhabit the mountain region. My city of birth is Asupiranu, which lies at the banks of the Euphrates. My mother, a high priestess, conceived me. In secret, she bore me. She placed me in a reed basket. With bitumen, she caulked my hatch. She abandoned me to the river from which I could not escape. The river carried me along to Aki, the water drawer it brought me. Aki, the water drawer, when immersing his bucket, lifted me up. Aki, the water drawer, raised me as his adopted son. And so Sargon of Akkad would become the first great emperor of men, at least according to some in history. This is the way of the city of man. At the beginning of the story of Exodus, we begin with a little summary of what we learned at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the, the end of the book of Genesis. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family: Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered seventy in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all the generations died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, and they multiplied greatly, increasing in number and becoming so numerous that the land was filled with them. Now in Hebrew, elements of this are nearly an exact quote of Genesis 1, where God tells the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The Israelites were being fruitful and multiplying and filling Egypt and this is a sign of God's blessing. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave, and 
and leave the country. So it's a little concerning if they're imagining you'll lose your labor force or just lose the war. But the pattern is set. We know how the city of man works. And the new king of Egypt is looking around and saying, hmm, these sons of Israel, they're too many for us. They're a liability. We'd better figure out a way how to keep them down. So we hatched a plot. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. So he made them slaves. And they built Pithon and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Well, what store cities? You remember back in the book of Genesis, granaries. Now, it might not seem so to us, but granaries are actually a very powerful technology. In Peter Brown's book, Through the Eye of a Needle, he notes that to the ancient world, granaries were evil economic villains. Quite as much as the sight of factories spewing toxic waste into the atmosphere in modern times, great granaries were, the, were a site calculated to trigger, um, um, to trigger disquiet in late Roman minds. Now, he's writing of a period far later than the one we're talking about here, but history moved pretty slowly back then, and Egypt was all about the granaries, if you go back to Joseph's story. Large Roman villas flaunted the wealth of their owners by being built upon solid granaries endowed with heavy locked gates. The ruins of granaries of the great 4th century village of São um, Cucufate in southern Portugal still stand 10 feet high above the plain, adjacent to huge cylindrical weights which all survived, um, which are all that survive of the villa's olive presses. The greatest granaries of all obviously began to the became you know were owned by the emperor at that point the emperor of Rome and Constantinople they were so huge they were simply called jaws. Well, why were granaries so powerful? Well, you buy the grain or you get the grain through taxation or you grab it through force. You grab the grain and you store it when prices of grain are low at the harvest. Everybody's got grain and then you hold on to it and you hold on to it till everybody's eaten through their own grain and now they need to spend gold to get grain. And so what are the children of Israel building? Great cities, great cities, store cities of grain, grain of Egypt. Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites read antebellum literature about how the southern plantation owners dreaded the slaves. They're their slaves, they're their property, but will they slit their throats in the night? Will they rise up and rebel? Because that's the way it goes. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly because, again, human beings make terrible beasts of burden. We're way too rebellious. They made them live bitter. Um, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. In all of their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Now, we would imagine these midwives would be shaking in their boots, being confronted with the god king emperor of Egypt. The emperors were intermediaries from the gods, bringing down divine favor and divine security for the Egyptians. And so that was, that's what he was doing, threatening these midwives. But apparently, these midwives were not to be threatened. The midwives, however, feared God. They feared God more than the king of Egypt. They feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, and they let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt looks around and there's all these baby Hebrew boys. Where have these boys come from? So he summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Egyptian women are not like, or Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. Now you've got to imagine that the first hearers of these stories laughed their heads off when they heard this. They are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives arrive. These, these slave women, they're strong, not like these, these Egyptian women that are they're sitting around drinking mint juleps. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, 
he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all of his people, every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile. Now this isn't just a means of murder. There's lots of ways to kill babies and little boys. The Nile was a god. Throwing them into the Nile was, in a sense, putting them in the hands of God and the minds of the Egyptians. But let the girls live. Well, why let the girls live? Isn't this patriarchy here? What's, what's with letting the girls live? Well, if, you, if, the, if the lineage goes through the boys and you let the girls live, well, then you basically absorb the girls. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Notice, the name of the father is not mentioned. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide, when she hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Can you imagine the surprise, because we've had this book for many, many years, when some, some historian and some archaeologist found this story of a cod and said, Oh, look, Moses and a cod have the same story. I would imagine it was certainly not a surprise to the story writers of the book of Exodus. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. She threw the baby in the Nile, right? King didn't say anything about a basket. So when Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, this is no mere bucket guy for Sargon to pull Sargon out of the water. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. Yeah, they used slaves. She opened it and saw the baby, and he was crying. Hmm. And she felt sorry for him. Very seldom do we see babies cry in the Bible, or have it noted. They cried all the time, of course, but Moses, little Moses, cried. This is one of the Hebrew babies. Well, I suppose you're, suppose you're supposed to throw it back, right? But she didn't. Then the sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a Hebrew woman to nurse your baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Not only does she get to keep her baby legally, but she gets paid to raise her own son. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Now, if you've not been paying attention to the story, can you note the sense of God's movement beneath the surface here? Can you note the sense of they're multiplying these brazen Hebrew midwives who can say such and such to the God King Pharaoh? Do you note how this baby, this special good-looking baby, is thrown into the Nile but with a basket and Pharaoh's own daughter rescues him and will be raised and even paid by his mother? The fleecing of Egypt is still beginning, but what will it be like? When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, to be raised in the court, to be educated in the court, to be taught all of the wisdom and knowledge of the people of Israel. But those first early formative years of the child's life, he might have been with his mother until could have weaned him at two, three, four, or even five. Could have been a small boy at this point, raised by his mother, now going to the court, into school, into education, the best in the land. She named him Moses, which, if you don't know, is an Egyptian name. Because Atmos, Tutmos, Ramses all have Moses' name in it. Its basic meaning is to father, to be fathered, or to born. And he will father the children of Israel out of Egypt. It'll be the birth of a nation. Tutmos means the god Thoth was born, or perhaps the god Thoth has fathered, or born of the god Thoth. Now, the Hebrews had a way of sort of taking off those pagan gods' names, and so, well, what we have left here is Moses. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now, what will become of this boy Moses? One day after Moses had grown up, he went out, to where his own people were and watch them at their hard labor. But he knew he was a Hebrew. 
He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, what will be of him? Will this be a Sargon of Levi? Will this be a Sargon of Egypt? Will this be a Sargon of Israel? Moses understands how revolutions work. Maybe they'll rise up and... They've been numerous. They've been powerful. The Egyptians have been scared. Now Moses is leading the spark, sort of like John Brown at Harper's Ferry. We'll talk about John Brown in a little bit. Now, there's a very famous quote by Louis XVI. Now, those of you who don't remember your French history very well would be forgiven to not know which Louis this was. This is not Louis XIV. This is Louis XVI. Louis XVI's wife was, anybody guessed it? It has to do with cake. Well, Louis XVI will, in fact, lose his head in the French Revolution, but this was some of his ponderings recorded by one of his officials when he's trying to keep the insurrection down. Have these men studied in the history of any people how revolutions commence and how they are carried out? Have they observed by what a fatal chain of circumstances the wisest men are driven far beyond the limits of moderation? And by what terrible impulses an enraged people is precipitated into excesses at the very thought of which they would have shuddered? Well, that was a prophecy of such because the French Revolution would in fact go very much this way, but Louis wouldn't have um, eyes and a head attached to a neck to see most of it. But Moses understands revolution. Sargon of Akkad understood revolution. Visigoths understood revolution. We all understand revolution. Take the man in top down. He deserves it. He probably does. But if you pause and ask, what comes after him? Well, it's usually the guy who took him down who is now the man on top. The next day Moses went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. What about the solidarity of the slaves? He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me just as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must be known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses because that's what you do with insurgents. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now, first of all, Moses is getting a lesson in revolution. Those who are on top don't like to be toppled, and they will kill those who are below. And especially if they're slave owners, well, they're used to brutality, and so they know how to do it well. But, those on the bottom won't necessarily stick together. John Brown marched into Harper's Ferry, into the armory there, and tried to unburden the American army of its armed forces and just imagined all those, all those enslaved people in all the farms around would get the cue and run to Harper's Ferry and get a weapon and the slave vault would arise and the American slaves would be free. Well... Slaves aren't always necessarily together in their brotherhood. They fragment and fracture because, well, when it comes to knowing who they're against, they're all in agreement with that. But knowing what happens next, that's a little harder. So Moses runs away and he goes to a well. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you've just received a little clue because Jacob, the servant, well, the servant of Abraham found Jacob, found Isaac, his wife at a well. Jacob got Rachel and Leah in the bargain at a well. Even in the New Testament, Jesus meets a woman at the well, and there's tension in that story. So Moses goes to a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs of water to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, mean old shepherds. But Moses got up. And came to their rescue. Moses, young man, fine-looking, strapping, killer of a man, really. Could be pretty fierce. Afraid of Pharaoh. Unlike the midwives, they would stand up to Pharaoh. Moses would flee. Well, scared away the shepherds and help them water their flock. 
Then the girls returned to Ruel, their father, and he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian. Notice how Moses is identified. He's an Egyptian. He's one of the oppressors. He's one of the people who's living by the city of man still. An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. Well, where is he? We've got seven daughters. Ruel asked his daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him here to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. During those days, however, back in Egypt, the king of Egypt died. Will Israel have a reprieve? No. This is the city of man. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now what's important here is a little later in the book we're going to learn that Israel had forgotten God's name. They had gone to Egypt and so thoroughly became Egyptian, and then so thoroughly became slaves. They cried out, but they didn't even know who to cry to. They just cried out to the universe, or cried out to the heavens, or cried out to any little god that was on some statue somewhere. They cried out. God opens poorly addressed mail, and he remembered his covenant. They didn't remember God, but he remembered them with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the children of Israel. Well, of course he sees them. Doesn't he see everything? No, 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 no. He saw them. He saw their pain. He saw their slavery. He saw their hurt. He saw their bondage. And God knew. Yada. That same word that Cain knew his wife. And Moses knew his wife and had a couple of sons. God knew his bride, Israel, and he was going to take action. But what kind of action? What kind of action will he take? Revolutions happen all the time. Kings are overthrown all the time. As Louis XVI, who lost his head, knew, round and round and round they go. Julius enslaves barbarians. Barbarians pillage Rome and topple his statues. Sargon usurps. Moses murders. The city of man is predictable. We live such short lives and are so forgetful, but these things go round and round and round and round. But during those days, the king died, and God remembered, and God saw, and God knew. John Brown, as I mentioned before, was an abolitionist, and he was a fierce abolitionist. And when there was blood shedding to be done, he moved to Kansas so that he could be on the side of right in Kansas and butchered a bunch of men with some, with some long swords. Well, John Brown believed that he could save the Union by arming the slaves so that they would rise up and they would all come together. So, in fact, he stormed and, in a rather poor effort, took over the armory at Harper's Ferry. And one General Lee, then a colonel perhaps, I don't remember exactly, but an officer in the American army was dispatched to go take the government's armory back at Harper's Ferry, which he did, and John Brown was captured. If you want a very interesting read historically, Midnight Rising was a very interesting book. But John Brown was, of course, sentenced to death, as Moses would have been killed by Pharaoh. John Brown was sentenced to death and hung. And, well, after they discovered a note in his cell, and his note read like a prophecy. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. And in fact, of course, slavery in America was purged away with blood. 
Half a million Americans died in that war. More Americans lost their lives in the Civil War than in any other subsequent war. But here's the thing about the blood of men. The blood of men, the blood of mere men, does not seem to suffice the cycle. Cain, the first city builder, the first of the city of men, laid its foundations with hands that had shed the blood of his brother. And the city of man has been that way ever since. The book of Hebrews says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, a mountain bathed in the blood of animals. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, the firstborn of the dead. That's Jesus, whose names are written in heaven. We are also the firstborn. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cried out from the ground for vengeance upon Cain. Others would take it upon Cain. God did not. He built a city. Eventually, Lamech would come and say, maybe God would avenge Cain seven times, but me, I'll avenge myself 77 times. And that's the city of man. And so God sends his son. And outside of Jerusalem, the blood of his son is shed. And the cycle comes to an end. Now, we will see what God will do in Egypt over the next coming weeks. We will see a revolutionary redeemer who, in fact, redeems, but in a different way. We will see an empire undone and a people freed from eternal bondage. We will see the beginning of their freedom from a deeper bondage that binds both slave owner and slave. Because as we've seen, slave owner and slave are both bound by something. And the real question is, what can unbind them? The blood of Christ speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, who cries out for justice from the blood of his brother.